The number of children diagnosed with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD, has steadily increased since 2000. In fact, it's currently estimated that 1 in 10 children will be diagnosed with ADHD at some point. While roughly half of these kids receive some type of behavioral treatment, there haven't been many studies exploring OT-specific support for adhd -er children. In the research we are exploring today, we will look at an OT program that features children setting their own goals, daily time management, and the use of time-assisted devices. Not to spoil the surprise, but this program led to significant improvement in both performance and satisfaction. After I review this research, I am so excited to welcome to the podcast adhd -er and pediatric OT, Bryden Carlson Giving. OTRL. He and I will discuss the practical implications for both OTs and our clients. So let's dive in. Welcome to the OT Potential Podcast, where we review new and influential OT journal articles, then invite on an expert guest to help us pull out actionable takeaways that you can implement in your practice starting today. Welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Lyon, OTRL. And before we dive into this topic of OT and ADHD, I wanted to let you know that this podcast may qualify as continuing education for you. You are probably listening to this podcast on a free podcast platform, but to gain CEU credit, you will need to be a member of the OT Potential Club, our OT continuing education platform. It is currently just $89 to join us in there, so I highly recommend you consider it. Bearing in mind that this could count as a CEU course, I wanted to state our two learning objectives so you can be thinking about them throughout the podcast today. Our first learning objective is that you will be able to recognize neurodiversity affirming assessment to utilize with ADHD or children. You will also be able to identify strength-based approaches that you can utilize in treatment. So let's begin by looking at this journal article, and then we will bring on Bryden to discuss how this research could play out in your practice. So the article that we are looking at today is called Occupational Performance Goals and Outcomes of Time-Related Interventions for Children with ADHD. It comes to us from the Scandinavian Journal of Occupational Therapy, and it was published in 2020. So the article begins with this orientation to ADHD and time perception. The DSM-5 characterizes ADHD by symptoms that are honestly a little vague. These include general inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity slash difficulty with self-control. But new research seems to be pointing to differences in the ADHD brain related to the dopamine system. And one specific factor underlying the behavioral differences may be time perception. Specific time perception challenges for people with ADHD may include time distortion or feeling like time is moving too quickly, difficulty with time estimation, and prospective memory tasks. I do want to say that prospective memory is a form of memory that involves remembering to perform a planned action or recall a planned intention at some future point in time. This is an interesting and very specific part of memory. So if it is new to you, I definitely encourage you to Google it and read a little bit more about it. So looking at time perception and daily time management, these differences in time perception can lead to ADHD or kids having difficulty with daily time management tasks. Any of the following can feel challenging for these children. Automating routines and habits, being on time for appointments, hurrying up if required, planning and completing long-term projects. So that's their intro to ADHD and time perception. And what are the current treatments for ADHD? The primary treatments for ADHD are pharmacological and psychosocial. Medication can reduce the core symptoms of ADHD and improve daily functioning. But a considerable number of children still present with difficulty in daily time management even when taking medication. 
While there are evidence-based psychosocial treatments for children with ADHD, they tend to be narrowly focused on staying organized at school. Which leads us to what is missing from the current research. The authors focus on these aspects missing from the research. Time-assisted devices and children setting their own goals. In the previous studies of children with disabilities, time-assistive devices like reminders or step-by-step schedules have been shown to increase independence, foster a sense of self-control, and assist with daily time management. There are two studies I'll link to where time-assistive devices have specifically been found to be beneficial in children with ADHD. However, none of the studies used an approach where children and their parents were able to set their own goals, which leads us to the research we are looking at today. So what was the intent of this research? The study we are looking at aimed to examine the outcome of a multimodal, time-related intervention to support children with ADHD. The focus was to help them both achieve their occupational performance goals and improve their satisfaction levels. So what were the author's methods to achieve this? This study was a pre-post design using children's and parents' ratings. The participants were recruited from psychiatric clinics and one habilitation service in Sweden. The inclusion criteria included that the participants were ages 9 to 15, that there was parent reported difficulty with time management despite the use of ADHD medication. In addition to parent participation, each family also chose a coach, typically an educator, to also participate. So what measures did they use? The Canadian Outcome Performance Measure was used to identify and prioritize challenges that impact performance in everyday living, serving as the basis for goal setting. The Kit for Assessing Time Processing Ability, or the KTID, gave information about time processing, and such info was helpful in designing the interventions in compensation and training. So looking at their specific intervention, the intervention lasts 10 to 12 weeks. Baseline information was collected in the first session, and then again at 24 weeks. One day of manualized education was given to parents and coaches at the beginning. The intervention overall had two components. The first was compensation. Three to four treatment sessions with an OT were performed at 90 minutes each. The focus was working on goals by structuring the environment, fabricating time-assistive devices, or using publicly funded devices. The second focus of treatment was remediation. This was 20 minutes daily, performed by the kids, along with short meetings with their coaches one to three times per week. This remediation component was manualized and carried out by the coaches with two sessions supervised by the occupational therapist. The time skills training was presented as challenging tasks inspired by the My Time program, which I will link to in our show notes. The program worked on practicing time perception, time orientation, and time management. So what were the results of this intervention? 27 children participated in this study. The COPM, or the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure, resulted in three main areas of occupational therapy performance goals. The first type of goals set by the kids were carrying out daily routines. The second was knowing the duration of an activity. And the third was knowing what will happen during the coming day, week, and month. Significant improvements were reported in both performance and satisfaction as rated by both the children and the parents. Interestingly enough, children reported performance and satisfaction at baseline and follow-up as higher than their parents did. So from here, we wrap up with the discussion and implications for OT practice. This study indicates that a time-related intervention strategy consisting of both compensation and remediation supported ADHD or kids in achieving their goals. A previous randomized controlled trial had shown that a similar program was more effective than education alone at improving parent-rated daily time management. This current study adds the importance of active participation from the children in their own goal setting in order to achieve their goals. Okay, that wraps up our article review, and there is so much to unpack in here, both in our current understanding about ADHD and what... OT intervention can look like. And I'm so thankful to be bringing on 
Bryden Carlson giving. Bryden is a neurodivergent and disabled occupational therapy practitioner with experience in pediatric outpatient, inpatient, and school-based settings. He is passionate about community-defined evidence practice, mental health promotion, trauma-informed care, and incorporating strengths-based approaches to promote a positive self-identity for his students. Brighton's work includes encouraging a shift away from an impairment-based perspective and returning to strengths-based occupational-centered practice with his doctoral research, including partnering with neurodivergent practitioners around the globe to create the first neurodiversity-affirming occupational therapy model. Bryden is the creator of Neurodivergent Nexus, an online resource hub to support practitioners in utilizing neurodiversity-affirming strengths. From helping individuals discover and embrace their sensory processing differences to collaborating with their family and education team to improve their ability to be neurodiversity affirming, Bryden aims to maximize his clients' quality of life and well-being to support authentic neurodivergent development. I am so excited to talk to Bryden, and without further ado, I am going to patch him into this podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Bryden. It's great to have you. I'm really pumped and excited to be here. Always an honor. Thank you, Sarah. I'm so thankful that you're here to talk about this topic. It feels like there's two interesting movements at play, which kind of start to collide in this paper. One, when we look at ADHD, there is just this movement towards neurodiversity affirming practice, which is an exciting movement that we've talked about over the course of the podcast, and we see glimmers of it in this paper. And second, for ADHD, there's a lot of neuroscience happening right now, too, and just an enhanced understanding of the differences and starting to get really specific, especially around time perception um, and how that is might be different for people for ADHD and how that is a strength and a challenge and something we'll be able to talk about today. So I'm excited to take those two pillars and kind of mesh them together in our conversation today. You have been on the podcast twice before. Usually I start with, how did you first find OT? But (laughs) for you, since you've answered that, I wanted to ask you about finding out as an adult that you had ADHD and why you prefer identity first language. I could see if you find that out as an adult where maybe that doesn't feel like part of your identity as strongly, but for you, it must. And I would just love to hear about that um, and that experience. Absolutely. So when I first realized that I was an adhd I definitely used person first language. So had ADHD or a person with ADHD because I think of how the world, like healthcare and just society, how we view ADHDers is oftentimes like in negative boxes. And so when I first kind of realized that, oh, I am an ADHDer, I'm like, wait, but this is like a like a negative facet of myself, but I'm not like a like a quote unquote problem adult or an you know. And so I actually at first to use like person first language, like I have ADHD. But then when I really started to kind of really explore lived experience literature and strengths-based literature around ADHD, I ended up really honing in on identity first languages. Like, no, that's, it's a part of who I am. So identity first language with ADHD is I'm an adhd I use adhd because folks know what I'm talking about, but in a dream world, I would love to be able to say like, I'm a vaster. And so that is variable attention stimulus tree. And what I really love about being a vaster versus an ADHD is that being a vaster, the, all the pathologizing and like super deficit based language within ADHD is lost. It's completely erased and it's really honing in on that yeah, I have a variable attention stimulus trait. Like I, I, I have attentional differences, which comes with its strengths and also its challenges, and it's a valid form of human diversity. And but for the for the purpose of this podcast, I'll just use ADHD or so I don't confuse folks. But yeah, it's really interesting because when it comes to the neurodiversity, the neurodiversity movement, there's been a lot of it centered on autism and how 
majority of autistic individuals prefer identity first language and there kind of remains to be really limited or nuanced conversations about identity first language when it comes to being an adhd -er. and so i hope that all my fellow adhd -ers, and maybe adhd -er might really resonate with them because i feel like the shift to identity first language recognizes being an adhd -er as its own culture and also kind of validates being an adhd -er is like a vital part of who i am and part, vital part of my my identity and because i think like language is a really powerful thing and through language we make a we make a case we take a particular stance on things and i think in my in my um perspective using identity first language with being an adhd -er, i'm making the case that being an adhd -er is not a bad thing and we are acknowledging and validating being an adhd -er as a valid identity and like i can't emphasize enough like how much like I can't imagine like my life without um, without being an ADHD or it's a vital part of who I am. And it also extends to disability. Like for me, an example for me is I like to refer to myself as being disabled because it's inherent it's an inherent part of who I am. And I like I can't turn it off like a light switch. My disability influences how I view the world and also how I'm impacted by society every day. Sort of like, you know, I'm, I'm queer, like I don't have gayness, if that makes sense. It's a part of who I am and it's a valid part of, valid form of human diversity. And yeah, identity to first language, it's, it's like even just switching a language, it can take a lot of reflection and practice, but gosh, it can be, really be a powerful thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so beautiful to hear you describe that. And I think for a lot of OTs, I graduated in 2011. This has been a major shift over our career to go from this um, person first language to identity first language. But I think it's really exciting. It's really empowering. Like you said, this language changes the way that we think um, and just feels like a really important change. I love the term vaster. Vaster? <laughs> is that, is that, am I <laughs> yeah. saying that right? Yeah, vaster. Um, I just learned that from you, and <laughs> I'm wondering if there's the acronym you said, but does that term also, do you think, relate to time perception a little bit, like a vast mm -hmm. sense of time? Or how do you, does that word like mean something specific to you? And follow up to that, what would you say are some of the strengths that you've found in your ADHD? Yeah, I think why I love vast so vaster so much is that it really recognizes that how I perceive time, which for me like attention and perception of time are strongly linked in very many ways. It recognizes that how I perceive time is not a deficit. It's not a pathology that needs to be fixed. It's recognizing, yeah, my perception of time, my attentional differences, they're they're often very um, different than a non-ADHD -er, and that's also okay and that's why I really love like variable attention stimulus tray like and like how that is personified like why I love the word variable is that every ADHD -er likely perceives time very differently from one ADHD -er to another and I love that word variable because it really allows that kind of like nuance and like human experience with time perception and attentional differences. Um, when it comes to like strengths related to my ADHD-ness, I mean, I'll even kind of like flip the script a little bit when talking about like the DSM-5 when it comes to diagnostic criteria when it comes to being an adhd -er. And so sometimes, um, like a lot of times we'll call like an individual like I hyper focus a lot so like I can concentrate concentrate on the things and the tasks that I love so much that I literally like I lose track of time and I don't pay attention to anything else around me and oftentimes in like the medical world we label like like um like an ADHD or hyper focusing on something like oh they're not listening they're being behavioral they're they can't focus on anything it's like actually like you bet that if I really care about a project or preparing a paper or doing like being creative with something that you bet that I can, that if that project excites me so much 
that I can probably focus on that task far for a much longer duration of time than a non ADHD or like usually a lot of folks might need to take like a break here and there but like for me like if I'm like working on some like photo editing like I could hyper hyper focus on that stuff for hours and like oh wait I didn't eat lunch it's now it's like two o'clock or wait I haven't used the restroom yet like I need like I really need to go use the restroom but I think that's the the key component is that interest um whereas like if it's a task or something that I find very boring or super not fulfilling but I need to do it I mean it's the prep the procrastination is absolutely real like I will wait until the end of time until I really have to do it yeah the hyper focus and and so sometimes for like meetings like I mean any sort of like really really super duper long meeting it's not really natural for human beings to like stay solitary for a long time like I often will stim or fidget with different tools to help me focus during long meetings and I always have music on like even right now like you can't you can't hear it but like in my headphones I have some nice like like chill ambient music going on because if like for me like it's probably sounds super off but like silence for me is really loud is actually like quite loud for me because if if it's really silent if i hear like a like a like a tree branch like crack or if i hear like a wind blowing like i just my attention just whoop, goes to hyper fix it on that um so si like pure silence is really distracting and so if i need to like do a lot of things that maybe i'm not super duper pumped about or like paying attention might be like focusing on attention might be tr tricky like i always love to use the the forest app which i don't know if you've heard of the forest app but it's a really great it's a free app where it helps me to practice maintaining focus during tax tasks where i really need to focus and maybe it's not like the most 100 percent fulfilling and filling my cup and so what happens is that you can set time limit time limits so like maybe in 30 minutes you can take a break but if you meet that goal without losing your attention like going on social media on the computer or something it'll plant like a digital tree and you can grow like a like a digital forest basically and so that external reward is like super duper fun and it combines my love for video games and for trees another strength of um i think that is very common for being an adhd is creativity and spontaneity so like my mind constantly pops up with like really fun and new ideas like actually one well, of my favorite parts of the day are driving and driving in my car because I'll be driving my car, like listening to music and a certain like verse from a song might like inspire like, oh, that I, I want to write a poem about this or might inspire like, oh, I want to illustrate this drawing or painting in this way. And so like there's it's, like the thought bubbles are like pop, like they, they, they come con like pretty frequently. Um, and so oftentimes we'll use like my Zinnia, it's a dig digital journal app. Um, that I organize strictly for this purpose of like organizing like art ideas and OT project ideas and stuff. And but yeah, when it comes to spontaneity, which the DSM-5 would probably call impulsivity and like label it as a super bad thing. Like when I get, when I think of new ideas, I get so jazzed and so pumped that I want to test and explore these ideas immediately. Like I like, oh, that'd be a really fun thing. I need to do it right now. I absolutely need to do it right now. Um, so like if I'm thinking of a, like if I randomly think of a friend that I haven't spoken to in a long time, like I'll text them Im immediately and be like, Hey, do you want to meet up for lunch today? Like <laughs> super, just out of the blue, super spontaneous. And I think would label it as like a negative form of like impulsivity from like a medical criteria standpoint, but you just get so jazzed that you want to try out these ideas and projects as soon as possible. Mm hmm Oh, I love hearing about some of those strengths and I just see those as we have interacted over the years, <laughs> um, how you've really just like harnessed that um, love of what you're doing and being able to go so deep into things. And it sounds like you also have these supports that you've found and used and have helped you over time. I think that's, yeah, just a beautiful picture of um, that lived experience as an adult. Part of the reason I was so excited to talk to you about this article was I can see you applying your pediatric OT brain to it and thinking like, what would be helpful from here in actual sessions, but also being able to think like, what would have been helpful for young Bryden and kind of looking at it from both of those lenses. So my question is, what were your 
just initial impressions of this article? Yeah, overall, I really did enjoy the article. I really loved how, the, the, I think if I had to pick one thing that I really loved the most about the article was how involved the student was in the goal setting process and how modifications and accommodations were incorporated throughout the article. Though I think if I had to like go down the critique route, um, I think like right off the bat, like even right away with the introduction, like there's a lot of like heavy use of pathologizing language, like right away, like in the introduction, you read like, you know, children and adolescents with attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, have deficits in executive functioning, including blah, 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 specific problems, blah, 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 blah. I mean, there's a lot of like, like, like right off the bat with the article, you're really free. You're, fr you're already framing as like, Hey, this ADHD or kiddo has some deficits. They have some problems and we're here to fix them. And um, like, there's no mentioning of examples of how ADHD or attentional differences actually work in the favor of the individual. Um, so it's just kind of pretty negative throughout. And there's so much, and like why this is so important is, I think even, um, I think I learned this from the fabulous Meg Proctor of Learn, Play, Thrive, where she did a podcast with, with someone, but anyway, they were talking about how there is so much research out there that has found how how medical and healthcare professionals talk about diagnoses, like it impacts how parents view their children. Um, so, like if you have an if you have an ADHD or kid that was recently diagnosed as an ADHD -er or diagnosed as autistic, if you have a doctor that's providing this diagnosis and they're talking about, oh yeah, it's a set of they have deficits in this, they have problems in this. I mean. You are just framing this child as like a bucket full of neg like negative characteristics. Um, and there's so much research and literature out there that how we talk about that really fr actually like heavily influences how parents view their children, their neurodivergent children as well, like into adulthood. Like it becomes ingrained as like a foundation for how they perceive their children. And so if we frame ADHD as a set of problems, we are gearing families to view their child as a set of problems too and like we can discuss how an ADHD -er has attentional differences and they have strengths while also acknowledging like the need for accommodations like they don't need to be mutually ex mutually exclusive and so I'm like looking forward to kind of recognizing like we don't always have to really ever talk about like someone from like a such a negative standpoint but I think we're like trained to do that in our education and to like be reimbursed through health insurance or to um, validate why someone may need some supports and therapy. Um, but I th we absolutely can advocate for supports and services with without that deficit-based lens, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's interesting to think about being on um, this trajectory of still moving towards neurodiversity-affirming care and I think in 10 years, we'll look back at an article like this and it will just stand out to us how pathologizing all the language is and how negative all the language is. And you can just kind of see that that transition happening where like at the end, there is some strength-based components used, but it's still in this really medicalized um, landscape. Um, so I'm excited to keep seeing us move yeah. to this new direction. For sure. I mean, kind of like what you mentioned, though. I mean, it's the article was 2019, and it was kind of like what you said, like kind of ahead of its time with really incorporating the child within the goal setting process. And I feel like even today, it is still a very, I think, honestly, like a very rare trait when it comes to e the evaluation process and just the goal setting process to actually inquire with the learner themselves. Like, hey, what do you want to work on? Like, how do you feel about these goals? Like, we're here to empower you. And so I really, for me, it was like actually a fresh breath of air to see how strongly involved and how important it was for the student to be involved with like the goal setting process. I really loved that. Yeah, that was a beautiful part for sure. I wanted to ask you several questions about just what this neurodiversity affirming approach can look like in practice. 
And starting with, you kind of just uh, set us up for this, but starting with how you talk to adults and caregivers of children um, or of ADHD children about their ADHD um, in a helpful way, what are just like concretely, what does that look like? What does it look like to talk about strengths instead of the other pathologizing way that you were just talking about? Yeah, I would. I always like to start off when talking about, you know, both with the with the with the learner and with the adult, talking about how being ADHD is a valid form of human diversity, and emphasizing that their the learner's brain is not broken or that it needs to be fixed. It just the brain has differences in how they process and experience the world, which provides strengths and char- strengths and characteristics that provide like unique traits and abilities and that there are yes like there are challenges to being an ADHD but holy buckets there are so many benefits to being an ADHD and so some ex- examples of how this may look for the student is that they the student like the ADHD is more likely to likely to be more daring with trying new things or being brave with trying new things or they will likely have infinite amounts of of energy like endless energy and will be the last person standing like if they're the adhd -er is playing soccer there's a high chance that that adhd -er is going to be one of the last few people like still like buzzing around the court and making gains on the soccer field compared to others because we are way more likely to have boundless amounts of energy and there's even a lot of research, strength-based research that's coming out about being an adhd -er that supports the notion that adhd -ers have a strong sense of justice in what is right, and adhd -ers are more likely to stand up for what is right. adhd -ers are known for their divergent thinking, their hyper-focus, creativity, and their curiosity, and which can make ADHD is like really with the right supports like epic students and really solving some really creative problems or having really creative solutions to really complex problems and so like we're out of the box thinkers and I think when like talking with an ADHD or student and their parents or their family or their caregivers like really like really challenging like hey like oh like let's talk about that diagnosis like how what are your perceptions of your of your um of your learner and how can we like gently reflect on those perceptions and how can we kind of dismantle some of like the the ableism when it comes to viewing adhd so you don't have to view your your adhd or learner as like they're not going to be automatically are not going to be a good student or a bunch of deficits but actually can be some with the right supports when needed um and when validated can really be like really epic students and really be epic problem solvers and creative thinkers in so many different ways i feel myself just like smiling as you're using this language because i'm like yeah that does describe the adhd students that i know and um flips the script i think and how a lot of people think and talk about adhd i love hearing that i also wanted to ask about talking to younger kids about their ADHD diagnosis. Like to me, a lot of these concepts are a little more high level. So if you're talking to like a five to nine year old, which is a little younger than this article, how do you start talking about those differences early on um, to someone who's younger and may not know the phrase Absolutely. like valid form of human diversity. Yeah. Or, yeah. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> like what's the. <laughs> no, good point, Sarah. No, absolutely. Um, I, for me, a lot of it is like, we'll do a lot of activities. Um, we'll be playing together, hanging out like in, like in the gym or just we'll, we'll be doing some activities together. And a lot of it is just validating of what I'm seeing. And so if I, um, like at the outpatient clinic that I used to be at, like had a zip line and they use a zip line, I will say like, like, man, like you used the zip line like 10 times. I love, I love how energetic you are. Or if we are doing an activity when they're working on their interests or they'll talk about like video games and they'll talk about how they did video games for like a long time. And like, wow, like you are really passionate about video games. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I play video games, like I kind of lose track of time. And sometimes I need to set a timer to help remind me um, that I get to play more video games. So like really just kind of framing it in a very positive manner while just like kind of 
in a positive way, like identifying things that you're observing. So yeah, I probably wouldn't be thinking like saying, oh yeah, you're a divergent thinker or cognitive dynamism and all that jazz. Bob was like, you are a very creative problem solver. Like I would never would have came up with that solution. So kind of framing it in that way. Yeah. Use the word brave early on too. And I know that would like really resonate with my young kids. And um, yeah, I love some of these phrases that you're pulling out and I see just how encouraging it is to use phrases like that um, and support our kids in that way. The article used the COPM like as one of the main assessments. And I was curious like what you thought about that and if you had other ideas for assessments that OTs could be using in their um, OT sessions. Yeah, I really like the use that they use the the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure. I think I, that's one of my favorite assessments. Some of my other favorite assessments really, which really can be used with any neurodivergent or disabled um, students are the ones that really maximize student involvement with the goal setting process that emphasize lived experiences, but also ensure there's like an evaluation of environmental barriers too that may impact like the students' participation. And so I'm just going to, I'll just like list a few of them. So like some of these assessments include um, the pediatric interest profiles. There is the child occupational self-assessment, the COSA, the participation and environment measure, children and youth version, the self-perception profile for children and adolescents, the visual activity sort, the heart drawing tool, and the perceived efficacy of goal setting system. And there's all all sorts of these really strength based assessments that really focus on lived experiences. I don't think any of those are standardized, and and that's like fully on purpose. Why I choose assessments that are not standardized often because for me, I mean, when you look at standardized assessments, you're essentially comparing a disabled learner to a non-disabled learner and for me like I'm never not going to be disabled and so we by I think for many standardized assessments you kind of under the table are like making neurotypicality is like the benchmark for functioning and it's kind of like an understated goal and so I really love like these assessments because you're you're never comparing like a neurodivergent learner to a not to a neurotypical learner it's all about hey what are your strengths what are some activities that you're really good at what are some activities that you would like to get better at what are some activities that are really or what are some things that are really important to you and how can we get there together like it's a very collaborative process and that's really for me like that's like the beauty of ot like that's occupation center, occupation center practice in like the best form I also want to make a note that I highly recommend any OTP that is working with a neurodivergent student, an ADHD or student, to really consider incorporating the sensory profile too, due to like a lot, there's a lot of research out there talking about how most neurodivergent individuals have sensory processing differences. And the sensory profile too is, from my knowledge, the only strengths based assessment that really examines sensory processing differences and honors that as well. Yeah, I love that list. And, and we'll link to all those assessments in our show notes so people can go look at it. But I love hearing ha about how even though this can be a change in thinking for a lot of people, these assessments still feel familiar, um, like still totally within the OT wheelhouse and using a lot of our same skills in a slightly different way to be more... Um, strength-based and affirming um and honestly just sounds more fun <laughs> for the therapy it is though like it is a lot more fun like ever since switching to switching from like the beery vmi the peabody the bot and going from like kind of like a really a strongly like deficit-based approach to really these assessments like i look forward to my evals now like i get to learn what my students are like passionate about and what are some things that they want to work on? Like, I'm not going to focus like just on what the families and the caregivers and the teachers are saying. I'm going to focus on not only on the, the student's perspective, but also like really empowering their perspective and their experience and really making sure that that is not only just equal to everyone else, but even like equated a little bit more because that's for me like the most important 
perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And it's almost like instilling a little like, uh, I'm thinking of like growth mindset where you're, you're just comparing to yourself. Like, here's where I am. Here's where I want to go. And these assessments are a tool to help me get there, which is again, using our OT skill set in a slightly different way. So that's assessment a little bit. I wanted to ask about the um, supports and interventions and how to leverage strengths in that part of the OT process. Absolutely. I really always like to, throughout my sessions, not even just being an adhd -er, but autistic or another form of neurodivergence is really emphasizing adhd -er strengths and characteristics as valid forms of human diversity. Um, and so like really exploring, like one of my favorite activities that I love to do, especially with a learner that was like recently diagnosed as an ADHD -er, cause a big part of my, of what I do as an OT is when I meet learners, I will, if I even get like a little bit of a vibe, like, oh, I think you might be neurodivergent. I usually provide a couple different like screening tools. And so if they score one way to really like emphasize like, yeah, maybe, maybe your learner should really go explore, you know, neuropsych to really evaluate like, Hey, maybe they are an ADHD -er. Um, and so one of my favorite activities is like, if they are like, yeah, no, being an ADHD -er really like validates how I experience the world or how my kiddo or my learner experiences the world. One of my favorite activities to do is a strengths-based activity where I go through all of the different characteristics of being an HD -er that the learner might have heard of in a very deficit-based way, like impulsive or can't focus or deficits in attention. I'll kind of like flip the script and kind of go through all these characteristics of like, okay, instead of saying frequently losing attention, um, it would be like, you know, when you're doing something that you really, really love, you kind of don't pay attention to the world around you because you're just so involved in your own world. And so I'll go for all these different characteristics. We'll make like little posters out of them too, if the learner would want, and we can add like their interests and stuff. So like right from the get go, we can ensure that we are not allowing that, that ADHD -er or that individual to allow like the negative deficit based language and how we talk about ADHD become a foundation for their identity. So we're kind of like challenging that. So instead we can foster like a positive self identity and like authentic, like neurodivergent development for sure. Um, just that will only provide greater quality of life. And it's also like way more holistic too. So when you're thinking about supports, then are you mostly thinking about modifying the environment? And if that's true, what does that look like? So it'll definitely, a big portion of it will be, actually mo all of it is the environment, but it's also how we view the environment. And so it's not just learning what the individual's like sensory processing patterns are and making sure that when there is an activity that um, we need to like complete and then I'm really setting up the the learner with success and making sure that the environment like best matches the learner's interests and we we have fidgets ready and available and that whenever they need to use a fidget for a little bit that they have unrestricted access to using a regulatory tool so like that's a big part of it but I'll, i think for me like the second half of environments and modifying the environment that is often missed is like really challenging like attitudes of the people that are involved with the individual. And so like really challenging, like how families perceive ADHD, challenging how teachers view the student and really making sure that they become aware of recognizing being an ADHD -er is a beautiful thing. And so that I might even be like, Hey, like maybe the teacher could even do like a quick little activity talking about like attentional differences or like teaching everyone like, Hey, here's a calming space or here's, you know, a bunch of different kinds of fidgets and tactile, like tactile tools that anyone can use. So like, even in that vein, kind of like a public health approach where you are offering supports and services and you're normalizing the use of supports and service, like those tools. So it's not just like, like kind of outing the learner, but you're kind of showing to everyone, like anyone can use the calm down space. Anyone can have a movement break. Anyone can do X, Y, and Z. 
Yeah, I feel like when it comes to the environment, like not just like modifying the task or modifying the room or promoting, making sure that there is unrestricted access to regulatory tools always, but really going beyond that as well and challenging those societal attitudes and the perceptions of the like learners like inner circles too because that's what's really going to promote like the little building blocks to grow over time if that makes sense yeah that's really powerful and i'm thinking back over the podcast and i'm like i feel like that's the most powerful tool that's been mentioned ever on the podcast is looking at changing the attitudes with the, within the environment and i think that's different than um, I know I've thought about supports and intervention before, but it feels really powerful and um, something I'm definitely going to keep thinking about. We talked a little bit at the beginning of the podcast about how there's so much coming out about ADHD, such a change in the like community of ADHDers, which leads me to ask what resources you find helpful, both as a therapist, um, but also maybe to refer families to? Absolutely. From a therapist standpoint, I cannot recommend enough um, Autism Level Up, which is a fantastic duo of neurodivergent like, like partners with Aut Autism Level Up, Dr. Amy Lauren and Dr. Jacqueline Feedy, incredible individuals. They really have strongly influenced how I view like emotion regulation and environmental supports. I mean, they're, I can like say without a doubt, they were the individuals that really challenged how I view environmental supports to extend beyond into attitude change and perceptions of neurodivergence. Um, another fantastic resource is obviously like the fantastic Meg Proctor of Learn, Play, Thrive. I mean, if anyone's even semi interested in neurodiversity affirming care, like Meg has neurodiversity affirming care, like like trainings are, are like a fantastic like introduction that can just set you up with the foundation for your practice for the rest of your life. Another one is OTs for Neurodiversity, which is created by two wonderful friends, Gregory and Jacqueline Buller, and they're fantastic individuals. When it comes to parents and families, I think what like a really fantastic resource is consider following the Attitude magazine. And so it's spelt like ADD is capitalized, but then the rest of it's like lowercase. It's an ADHD -er magazine. They The magazine still like, I mean, it, it used to and kind of continues to use some like pathologizing, like, like medical, medical, medicalized, pathologized like language. Though I feel like compared to many other resources out there, it's far better. Like they actually have come out like recently with some pretty fantastic articles on changing how we view how we view being an ADHD -er. and it's and the language is very accessible for not even just professionals, but especially for parents and families and really focuses on lived experiences. Um like I said, it hasn't always been like that way, but this past year or two, it's I feel like the magazine has really had like a massive paradigm shift. For sure. That's awesome. Yeah, they'll, I'll link to all those and um, sounds really helpful. My last big picture question was we've talked throughout the podcast about this changing trajectory that we're on where we're headed into this new reality. We're still taking steps to get there of neurodiversity affirming practice. I was wondering if you would just paint a picture for us of your ideal world of what OT supports can look like in this new paradigm. Yeah, if I could really put like a big stamp on it and be really recognizing and validating neurodivergent ways of living and being as valid occupations that don't need to really be changed or quote unquote normalized. Like I really challenge our profession to really reconsider the behaviors and expressions of life that are associated with ADHD so that like how I perceive time and how ADHD or students perceive the world and perform in the world is 
like they're seen as valuable and worthy of conservation, like, like really conserving like the ADHD-ness, which I know is like a huge paradigm shift. Cause when we think of like disability, we don't, we're taught to never like conserve disability and preserve a disability. But like when we preserve disability and we really advocate that the future like is disabled and like, that's a big, beautiful thing. We, and like keeping that alive, we really encourage like disabled individuals to like really flourish instead of constantly trying to like normalize ourselves or be perceived as less than. So I think for me, that's like, that's a big mindset shift. And I'm hoping to like that to be like, I don't know, gross and pull it, put in like a little shameless, shameful plug. But I really hope, um, like neurodivergent nexus is helpful for a lot of OTs. So, and I really am excited that neurodivergent nexus really will help OTs to go beyond just like, pres- like writing strength-based goals and being neurodiversity affirming in their care, but going beyond that and like challenging like the bigger systems and dismantling those ableist systems. So a profession can actually be more anti-ableist, if that makes sense. Yeah. Tell me what that looks like. What, what does it look like for us to be anti-ableist? That's been a thread on the podcast. And I would just love to hear someone describe what that looks like, because I think that's a new thread for a lot of us, but it's at the core. It's been at the core of many of our podcasts. So I'm going to put you on the spot to describe. No, absolutely. Oh my gosh. Yes, absolutely. And so for me, anti-ableism really became a strong concept because of a fantastic mentor, friend, colleague, remarkable individual, um, Christy Patton. Um, she did a wonderful Eleanor Clark, Eleanor Clark Slago lecture um, a couple years ago and really talking about how our profession needs to go beyond like like, oh, I'm going to try to like not be ableist or I'm, I'm going to try to maybe like be neurodiversity affirming in my care or I'm going to try to write, like change how I write evals to have more affirming language. Like really going beyond that and being anti-ableist, which means what I love about being anti-ableist is that there's action, there's follow through. Like, okay, what can I do tomorrow to not just provide neurodiversity for me care, but make the profession itself be anti-ableist. And so really challenging the system of OT to be anti-ableist because ableism like really proliferates throughout our profession from our assessments to our interventions. And so really challenging the system of OT to be anti-ableist. And so I'm hoping that with neurodivergent nexus, with one of the components being, um, and a neurodiversity affirming OT model, the first step in being anti-ableist is reflecting on any internalized ableism. Like even as a neurodivergent disabled person, I have my own <laughs> internalized ableism that I'm still like trying to navigate and like recognize and challenge and shift. And so really like the first step is always like reflecting on ableism. And there's a couple of really great um, screeners that have been created by neurodivergent and disabled OTs to kind of begin that process. and being okay with being wrong and accepting like, yeah, like my education society has all really influenced how I view disability and really challenging like the foundation of OT and how we view disability to be um, anti-ableist. It's tricky. Like this work has been like the center of my life for like two years and still like, I'm like catching myself like, whoa, Bryden, like let's take a step back. Like we gotta, we gotta shift gears here. That has been a theme of our last couple episodes on the podcast where if a therapist has the courage to be open to heading down a neurodiversity affirming trajectory, like buckle up because that is a much bigger path than you realize. And it's going to change your worldview, how you think about the world and what you hope the world becomes. Um, And it's an exciting journey, but buckle up for it because asking questions just spurs more questions. And, mm-hmm. and it's a continuous it's process. To, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's not like a, like one time you reflect on 
like the assessments you use or how you are challenging ableism within the profession. Like it's a continuous, like lifelong process for sure. Yeah. Well, I'm so thankful that we've been able to be a part of your journey on this podcast. And <laughs> in my head, I hope someone listens to all three of your episodes because you oh, do kind goodness. of get to hear the journey that you've been on in the past yeah, no couple of years. And I appreciate you being here and sharing with us. And I always feel challenged and inspired and, um, I guess, just excited for where we're going. We're at our rapid fire time if you're open to yeah, uh, of just a couple questions. What's one moment you've had in therapy that you'll never forget? I honestly, I think it goes back to that example of that strength-based activity where I kind of challenged a lot of like the deficit-based language that we used with a, with a learner that was newly diagnosed as an adhd -er. And so doing that ADHD or strength-based activity with a newly di with newly diagnosed ADHDers is super fun and exciting because by the end of it, families and parents are super excited and like they can like exhale, which is really beautiful. Mm. What's something you've read recently that has inspired you as an OT? Sins and Ballads, Skin, Tooth and Bone, the, mo the Basis of Movement in Our People, that text. It's a disability justice textbook. I mean, textbook is a very like formal, a very formal word, but as that book, because it really intersects like race and so many elements and, and the intersectionality of disability is, it's real. And that text really validates that, but that text really challenged everything I thought I knew about disability and was incredibly wonderfully thought provoking and how I view OT as well. Awesome. And we've talked about so many things today. What's the closing thought you want to leave us on? I think really for me is that how neurodivergent individuals experience the world, perform in life, and just in like the activities that we do to fill our cups, um, our occupations, like those are valid occupations. And neurodivergent occupations will likely may like look different yeah they may be personified or viewed or may even like look different than like neurotypical occupations but that's also like totally beautiful and that's totally okay so even like really challenging how folks like how we do view an occupation and how that might look like for a disabled individual well Brian, this has been super helpful i'm so grateful for your willingness to share your own experience and uh, to talk about this article and to push us to think to this next reality. Thank you so much for this conversation. Oh, goodness. Honor to even like ever share virtual presence with you, Sarah. You're <laughs> remarkable. So thank you so much. Thank you. Wow, you all, I learned so much from this episode. There were multiple practical resources that were shared during the discussion, and I'm going to link to them in the show notes for you. I also wanted to remind you that if you are interested in earning a certificate for your time today, what you are going to do next is head to otpotential.com and either sign in or sign up for the OT Potential Club. And as always, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I hope this podcast helps keep you informed and inspired as an OT professional. Take care and we'll talk next time.